Before I start uh, our conversation today, um, let's play a little game to break the ice a little bit. I want you to take a look at a photo of this stadium here. And I want to see a show of hands. Raise your hand if you think this is in the condition to be a national stadium. Raise your hand if you think this is deserving to be a national stadium. Raise your hand if you think this is worthy of being a face of an entire country. Well, judging from the very few hands being raised here, I can bet that most of your answers is a resounding no. But what if I told you this is actually a photo of the press stand of Meeting Stadium during an Asian Cup qualifiers match in 2019? And if you look at this title here, you can see that many areas of Meeting is degraded and damaged. But no repairs, no renovations have been made. The seats and the stands were so dirty that guests had to cover them with newspapers or nylon bags. Now what if we fast forward it, say, three years into the future? You would expect repairs or renovations or sanitations to take place, right? Because after all, this is our national stadium. Who in their right mind would let the face of our country look like this? What would our people think? What would our international friends think? Well, this photo was taken in December of last year, precisely three years after the first photo that I showed you. And as you can see, somehow the seats and the stands look even filthier than before. Three years later, and guests still have to cover their seats with nylon bags and newspapers because the seats were even dustier. And those who did not cover the seats with newspapers, they chose to stand entirely. Three years later, same problem, and it's almost the exact identical headline. Do you see what's happening here? It's one problem. It's a problem that everyone can see. And it's a problem that affects pretty much everyone who goes into the stadium. But nothing has been done about the problem. No one has actually done anything about it. They've either used temporary solutions, like covering the seats with newspapers or nylon bags, or avoided the problem entirely by choosing to stand. What about the people who are in charge of the stadium? Earlier I mentioned those were the people who paid to be in the stadium, who paid to be there as supporters. What about people who are in charge of the stadium who not only have the ability, but the responsibility to do something about the seats, to fix the seats, to clean the stands? Three years later, and this problem still persists. It appears to be infinite and permanent. Well, this is something that I like to coin myself permanent temporariness. And much like our event theme of infinite limits, it's an oxymoron. And it describes the permanent state of supposedly temporary fixtures, like the seats that I just showed you earlier. Their dirtiness and filth are supposed to be temporary. They are supposed to undergo cleaning. They're supposed to undergo renovations and sanitations. But the key word here is supposed. Because after three years, those seats have remained like that, and nothing has been done about them. And that is permanent temporariness. So where did it, where did it start? I think it began as an evolution of our positive traits, our traits of resilience, our traits of resourcefulness and passion. Traits that we garnered from years and decades and centuries of warfare and hardship, of bloodshed and of tough times. And by having these traits, it has allowed our people and our country to stand tall and come out victorious against wars between us and the most formidable foes with the most formidable weapons on our planet. And with these traits, we not only come out alive and standing, 
But we came out victorious. And if it wasn't for these traits, I wouldn't be here rambling and you wouldn't be here to listen. So I'd like to lead you to a little story uh, that my grandma told me when I was younger. She had lived through the 1946 uh, invasion of Hanoi by French forces in December of 1946. And she told me the story of how when her neighborhood was left weaponless while French forces were converging from the flanks. They were facing certain death. But they, didn't, they did not accept that. They did not accept that they were going to die, and they stood up and they did something about the situation. They were resourceful, and they made barricades out of any sort of sturdy furniture they could find. If you look at this photo here, you will see that they use wardrobes, they use beds, and they use doors. Anything remotely sturdy they could find, they found, and they used as barricades, which halted the enemy's advance and bought themselves more time to retreat to safer positions and save their lives. Those who were more unfortunate, have founding, finding themselves facing off with the enemy, they did not accept that either. And they were resourceful, and anything remotely lethal they could craft from scratch, they crafted from scratch. I'm talking Molotov cocktails, I'm talking wooden sticks and metal bars. And they used these things and they defended themselves, which saved their lives and is the reason why I'm here today. Or if we fast forward, say, a few decades in the future, when the location of the city that we are in right now, maybe even this exact auditorium, was bombed relentlessly for 12 days and nights by what was thought to be an indestructible flying fortress. Our people had gathered the little resources and technology that they had, and they stood tall against the 20,000 tons of bombs that were dropped on them. A fun fact is, American forces thought that the only way their flying fortresses could crash is either due to weather causes or collision with one another. They thought that because we had such little resources and such little technology, we couldn't make a single dent on their planes. We shot down 34 of them, by the way. I think that deserves a round of applause. They survived and they shot down these planes and protected their livelihoods because they were passionately unaccepting of the situation. They were passionate, which allowed them to be resourceful, and they were unaccepting, which allowed them to be resilient and allowed them to stand tall. But the more society has progressed, I feel that the more passion has turned into ignorance, and the more accept, uh, unacceptance has turned into acceptance. When we see a problem, we will be ignorant and we will be accepting. We will be ignorant and think, ah, it's not my problem, or I don't care, or we will be accepting and think, ah, it doesn't really bother me, or it's fine. We will think that someone else will fix it for us, that we don't have to do anything. We will just accept the problem for what it is. And I say this not because I think that we are lazy or independent people. Quite the opposite. I think that each and every one of you here is all immensely passionate individuals and passionate people of our country. But the truth is we're slowly losing these traits because we've gotten so used to problems not being solved that we've grown exhausted and we've grown to be accepting. Ironic problems like this photo here. Uh, this is Lombian Bridge, one of the most iconic fixtures of our city. And when you come here, you will see a big red sign that reads, traffic safety is every family's happiness. Traffic safety in the form of a giant hole in the middle of the bridge. I mean, say what you want, but that view is to die for. Or ironic problems like this. Do not litter signs surrounded by litter. Which is why if we ever find a dusty seat, we have a dirty stand on our national stadium. We won't clean the seats, but we will cover them with nylon bags. We will cover them with newspapers. We will stand. We will do anything except 
doing and solving the problem. And this is not an issue about money or resources or manpower or infrastructure. Truth is, we have all of these things in hand, but somehow our problems seem to be indefinite. They seem to be infinite. And our solutions are per either permanent or non-existent. This is because we are not angry enough, we are not passionate enough, and we are not bothered enough to do anything about the problems that we see happening around us. We don't care. We don't care about anything. We don't care about the problems. And we are ignorant and we are accepting. And you know, I think the, f the saddest thing about this is we used to care deeply. But now, we deeply do not care. So, you have to stop accepting and be angry. To start solving problems and to start working towards permanent solutions, you have to stop being ignorant. You have to, and you have to start being angry. Because when you're ignorant, you will deny your, pr your problems of solutions and you will make way for those problems to be indefinite. So you have to be angry. But what does being angry actually mean? And how can you meaningfully be angry? Well, to me, anger is a very powerful emotion that will enable you to make change, that will enable you to start solving problems. But in Eastern culture, it's often looked at in a negative light. It's often given a very negative connotation. We have this saying, which translates to, a full stomach loses appetite and an angered mind loses wisdom. In our culture, we think that people who are angry are unwise, they lack good judgment, and they are destructive. But I think this is the classic case of confusing between bitterness and between anger. And to fight for meaningful change, to start making change, and to enable problems being solved, you have to tell the difference between the two. I think there's a line between these two emotions. The reason why people think that when we're angry, we will be destructive, is the confusing between these two emotions, these two state of minds. I think that when you're angry, uh, sorry, when you're bitter, you will be sour. You'll be filled with a sense of hate that will cause you to have a clouded judgment and will make you have a bad thinking and have a bad judgment and be bitter. But when you're angry, you will feel that inspiration. and You will feel a burning desire to go out there and do something about the problems that you see happening around you. You will feel determined and you will feel inspired to start solving problems. So be angry. But how does one go about being angry? How can you meaningfully be angry? To be angry and to not be bitter, you have to start reflecting. You have to start thinking. You have to drop your ignorance and stop being accepting. And start thinking and start making observations about the problems that you see happening around you. You, you should think about how they're being solved with temporary solutions, or think about how they're not being solved at all, and feel that anger, and feel that determination to go out there and do something about the problems that you see happening around you. At my school, uh, we have this very wonderful fixture called the self-study rooms. And uh, it, it's a very wonderful thing that uh, you can go in and do your own work in your free time. I love it, and I bet that many of you will love it too. But uh, the only thing that could take wonderful out of my sentiment for it is a glass door that you see right here. Every time this door closed, it let out the most earth-shattering and ear-numbing noise known to mankind. Now, I would show you, I would let you listen how this door sound, but then I would go down in history as the first TED speaker to deafen an audience to get a point across. But I did make a, a visual representation I think will, knit, will hit the nail on the head pretty closely. So this door here, it was as loud as a supersonic jet, as loud as an explosion, 
as Optimus Prime, as a T-Rex, and bonus points if you know this guy. It sounded like every of these things combined. I think you get the point now. The point is it was very loud. And every time this door closed, it let out this noise that made everyone startled. It had made everyone lose their train of thought. It made everyone forgot what they were doing and have their thoughts derailed entirely. Everyone was affected by this problem. But you know what was so frustrating? is that no one found it in themselves to be angry. No one felt truly bothered by this noise. Every time this door let out that noise, everyone was startled. But when this noise reverberated and it stopped, everyone had resumed what they were doing and forgot like that noise was a thing in the first place. The extent of their emotions was mild annoyance. They were only mildly annoyed at this door. And so because of that reason, this door remained like that for months and days and years on end. But not me. I was angry. I had thought about how this door broke my train of thought. I had thought about how this door broke my concentration. I thought about how I, this door made me forget what I was doing, and it made me startled. I was angry, and I found it in myself to, f to have a determination and to be inspired to fix this problem for good. But then a small problem arised. You see, I'm only a student. I wasn't a technician. I wasn't a handyman. I didn't know how to fix this God-forsaken door. And you see, at this point, most people would give up and say, oh, because I don't know how to fix this door, i just leave it like that. I'll just accept it for what it was. But you see, that's where the magic of your anger comes in. It will inspire you to go beyond your limits and find solutions to problems for good, even when you don't know how to. And so I found it in myself the anger and the inspiration to go fix this problem. And I went on the internet and I watched YouTube videos about how to fix a lousy glass door. And as you can probably tell from the photos that you're seeing right now, I wasn't very successful in my conquest. I mean, I only had to myself a pen and some duct tape. I wasn't very successful into fixing this door. And this door kept on being loud. And that was another opportunity for me to give up and accept it. But I was still angry. And because you see, that's where another magic of your anger comes in because you will be so determined to fix solutions, uh, to fix problems, and to go out there and find solutions, that you will move beyond your limits and solve the problem no matter what. And so I had brought attention to someone who not only had the ability, but the responsibility to fix this door. I had brought my attention to him, and he fixed that door, and now that door is the most quiet door you will ever use. Imagine if I hadn't gone angry and just accepted the door for what it was like all of my peers. Would that door be quiet? No. That door would still be loud and no one would be here to give a talk about it. Everyone would still be mildly annoyed. So that's why you gotta be angry, guys. And another, another instance, like the stadium seats that I showed you earlier in my talk, you were angry. I was angry, we were angry, and as a collective, we spoke up. We expressed our anger as a community, which led to the problem being solved, which led to change, which led to solutions, which led to the people in charge cleaning these godforsaken seats. And now the face of our country is clean because you were all angry. And so I think I should wrap up now before the organizers get angry and kick me off stage. I think that anger is a powerful emotion that will inspire you to go beyond your limits. You will find in yourself the determination and the inspiration to go out and make change, to go out there and do something about the problems that you see, even when you don't know how to. And you don't even have to start big. I'm not saying you should go out there and solve world hunger immediately. You don't instantly have to go out there 
and find a solution to world peace. You can just start small, from your community to the world. Be angry at the way your neighbors are having a loud karaoke session at 3 in the morning and go tell them to shut it down. Be angry at how people are using non-biodegradable material that is damaging the planet and go start a project that promotes a healthier alternative. Be angry at the mistreatment of homeless people in your city and go and advocate for them. Be angry at that loud glass door and don't accept it for the way it broke your concentration. Be angry and go fix it or find a way to fix it. Be angry that people are not being angry enough and go make a whole lousy TED talk about it. Just be angry. Thank you. <laughs>